Hey everyone, it's been a minute since I've been with you here on this show. Well, it's only been a week, but it feels like a lot longer. I have missed you and I'm so happy to be back talking about all of these great subjects. And to those who have written to me, no, I was not on a tropical vacation taking a work hiatus. I actually went to what you could call conservative intellectual Disneyland at the ARC conference in London. I'm going to do a show later this week on the conference and all of my takeaways and things that I learned. But today we're discussing another subject, a hugely important one, arguably the biggest issue facing the West and that is the proliferation of children growing up without two parents in the home. This issue actually came up quite frequently at the art conference this past week. There was one night where I attended a dinner where child rights advocate Katie Faust was speaking, and she said something that synopsized this issue so well and that was so moving that it actually made me tear up. She asked the audience, what do children want most out of anything in the world? Now, of course, if you asked a child that, they'd probably say a cookie. But if you really got down to it and you really asked the child, what is it that you want more than anything else? You know what they would say? They would say that they want to be loved by their parents and that they want their parents to love each other. That is so true. But in 2023, we're told that acknowledging that fact is racist and heteronormative and offensive to single mothers and reflects an obsession with antiquated societal constructs. Baloney. The people who are harmed the most by that way of thinking are children. But I am so pleased today to welcome Melissa Kearney onto the show. She is an economist who thinks straight on this issue. She has bravely analyzed this with fantastically well-compiled data in her new book, To Parent Privilege. I'm Julie Hartman, and this is Timeless. <laughs> everyone and welcome back to Timeless. As I said, it is so great to be with you after a little bit of a hiatus. And it is so great to be with Melissa Carney. I did not pronounce her name correctly in the introduction, but hey, I guess I'm a little rusty after being gone for just seven days. <laughs> Melissa Carney is an MIT trained economist who serves as the Neil Moskowitz Professor of Economics at the University of Maryland, where she teaches at both the undergraduate and the PhD level. She works, writes for, or is otherwise involved in many institutes and think tanks, including the Aspen Economic Strategy Group, the National Bureau of Economic Research, and the Brookings Institute, just to name a few. She has been published in numerous leading academic journals and has testified before Congress on the topic of U.S. income inequality. Her most recent book, as I said, is the subject of today. It is called Two Parent Privilege, How Americans Stopped Getting Married and Started Falling Behind. Professor Carney, welcome to Timeless. Thank you for being here. Thanks so much for having me, Julie. Well, as I told you before the show, I loved your book. I read every word of it. And what a timely and hugely important subject, as I said. And I told you also that I love your title, Two Parent Privilege, because we live in a culture now where we hear the P word, as I call it, a lot. We hear yeah. about white privilege, hetero privilege, cis privilege, you know, in, insert all different kinds of privilege. But we rarely hear about this, which is arguably the greatest privilege of all, having two parents in the house. How did you come up with this title? Yeah, it's a good question. This was not the initial title to the book. So really? initially, I proposed calling the book Raising a Nation, and I was going to talk about raising kids in two-parent households and raising a nation, and um, the publisher was like, that's a terrible title. So then I started calling it The Family Gap, because if you read the book, then you know a big theme of the book is that there's a real gap between the family structure of higher educated, higher income parents and less educated, lower income parents, and these lead to gaps in kids' outcomes. And then the marketing team said that was a terrible title and they were gonna, they wanted to put the book out with the title, um, The One Parent Problem. And I said, absolutely not. 
that's part of the reason why we can't have a conversation about family structure is because it sounds like or people worry that when we have this conversation, we're blaming single moms, we're saying they're the problem. Um, and in many cases, the single moms who are the ones doing this all by themselves are their kids' greatest asset. And so they're not the problem. And so then I decided to flip it and, and focus on really the advantage or the privilege that those of us who are raising our kids in two-parent households are giving to our kids, those of us who are raising our kids with a, a committed partner or spouse, that's a privilege we have. And, and like you said, we talk all about privileges, all kinds of privileges, because there's a lot of worry about class gaps and inequality. And this is one of the biggest privileges out there. And it's massive and it's not acknowledged enough. And so that's, that's how I landed on two parent privilege. Well, you landed on on the perfect title. I, I remember just just quickly when I was launching this show about a year ago, I just racked my brain over a title. I didn't want to call it the Julie Hartman Show. And I finally came upon Timeless because in everything I do, I aim to talk about things with a timeless worldview. And I think mm -hmm. that, you know, a lot of principles are timeless. A lot of wisdom is timeless. Anyway, I, I remember someone saying to me, and it was so liberating <laughs> For, for me, but maybe not for an author. He said, you know, Julie, titles of shows, unless they're really egregious, actually don't matter that much. But titles of books matter oh. hugely. So anyway, again, you, you did a fantastic job with this one. So, so much to discuss. I mean, you just have chart after chart. You really cite so much data. And I want to make it clear to the audience that there, there are many ways to tackle this issue. You know, obviously, the, the, the problem is a cultural issue. We're going to talk about that. But you really take it from an economic, data-driven perspective. And I so appreciate that objectivity. So let, let's just start here, if you don't mind, just really laying out some facts. And then we can sort of dive into why. Can you please provide a synopsis of the trends of marriage, motherhood, uh, out of wedlock birth rates over the past 40 years? Sure. So the big ones that really motivated my look at this subject or my commitment to writing this book was the fact that the share of kids in the U.S. growing up in a married parent home over the past 40 years, so everything I look at is from 1980 and on really, that's decreased from 77% of kids to 63% of kids. So let me say that very clearly. Only 63% of kids in the US right now live with married parents. And it's a mistake to think that what's happening instead is that kids are just living with two parents who are essentially all but married, um, except for the name or the legal structure. It's not the case. In fact, 30% of kids live outside a two-parent home. 21% of kids now live with just an unpartnered mother, meaning neither a spouse or an unmarried partner in the home. Um, another 4.5% live with an unpartnered father. Another 4.5% live with neither parent. Uh, and so, you know, the large number of kids living outside a married or two-parent home is something that should really worry us, given, and I'm sure we'll get this, all the benefits that confer to kids who live with two parents, married parents. Um, the other really important fact to know about these trends is that the decline in married parent homes for kids has happened predominantly outside the college educated class. So 30% of kids today whose moms don't have a four year college degree live with just an unpartnered mother as compared to only 12% of the kids whose moms have a four year college degree. And this too is, is a really important thing to keep in mind because it's not the case that the women who are finding themselves raising kids by themselves are the most successful, economically successful in society, just the opposite. And so this trend of a decrease in two parent, married parent households has really happened outside the college educated class. It's eroded the economic security of the middle class to a large extent because now those homes are much more likely to only have one adult in the home. And it's and it's also accentuated and amplified class gaps, making making it not surprising basically that kids that come from different backgrounds are less prepared when they get to school and have less um, economic educational success throughout their lives. Okay, so to speak about it just in really crude terms, over the past 40 years, 
We have seen marriage rates go down across the board. We have seen out of wedlock rates, i.e. children born to parents who are not married, go up. We have seen primarily the parent, the primary parent who a child is living with in the case of a single parent home is the mother. And, yeah, and, and we have seen marriage rates decrease, um, uh, again, not just across the board, but specifically among non-college educated individuals, both men and women. Is that accurate? That's right. Let me just add a little bit. So so you're entirely right in, in the way you've described the trends. Mm-hmm. So it's important to realize that what's driven the increase in the share of kids living outside a married parent home is not an increase in divorce. Divorce is actually down among people who are getting married. It's really a separation of marriage from having kids outside the outside the college educated class. So so now actually a majority of unpartnered mothers have never been married. So that's an important trend that's gone on here is that there's an increase in never married mothers. And so now 40% of kids in the US are born to unmarried parents. That too is a huge increase. 1980, it was 18% of kids. So 40% of kids are born to unmarried parents. How many are born to single parents? Or what percentage? So I'm defining unmarried as being um, as being in the in the birth certificate data that means they're unmarried. And so a lot of those parents are in cohabiting relationships. I think that's what you're getting at. Mm-hmm. Those are very fragile relationships in the U.S., which is why there's so much of an emphasis in my book on marriage. Because even though a lot of those kids' parents are in some sort of romantic relationship, maybe even cohabiting, many of those dads will not be around by the time the kid turns five um, and a majority won't be around by the time the kid turns 14. And so it's really, if we think about the share of kids living outside a married parent home, it's only a few additional percentage points, like three or four additional percentage points are living with unmarried parents at any given time. I see. And, and this is really important because when 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 I've been in conversations with people and I cite that statistic that 40 percent of children in, in America are born to unmarried parents, I will often hear the response, well, unmarried doesn't necessarily mean that only one parent is present. You know, they can be unmarried right. and together. But as as you cite and as you just said, that, that is not true. It tends, uh, it tends to be a single parent home. I just want to quickly make the audience aware of this study that I thought was so fascinating that you, you cited in your book, a Princeton study called the Fragile Families and Child Wellbeing Study of 1998. It gathered data on 5,000 mothers and children in 20 large U.S. cities. And fat, and in most of them, 75% of that group um, 75% of the couples in that group were unmarried at the time of their child's birth. And what this study found is that when interviewing those parents, those unmarried parents having children, the vast majority of them said that they felt confident that they would marry the spouse. And then by the child's fifth birthday, only about a third of the unmarried parents were still together. There were many new partners and new kids introduced into the family. And then you cite from the study that a third of the fathers disappeared from the children's lives. That debunks this idea that, oh, well, you know, just because they're unmarried doesn't mean that it's necessarily a a single mother household. Overwhelmingly, it is. Yeah, overwhelmingly, it is. So so the sort of circumstances of a parent's relationship at their child's birth, whether the mom is married or unmarried, is very, very sticky. It's very predictive of what their circumstances will be by the time you know the child is, again, 12 or 14. And that survey was really the work of Sarah McClanahan, who was just, she's she was tremendous, and she really, in many ways, started this whole field of a close data-driven look at family structure and how that determines children's um, trajectories and outcomes in life. Okay, so again, forgive me if I'm sounding sort of simplistic. I just want to really summarize, lay down the facts here because there are just so many. <laughs> there are so many of them, and I, I want to make yeah. sure we're we're all clear before we we get to the why question, which is really the essential question. So most children who live in two parent households have parents that graduated from college. The, the, those are those are the parents mostly that that uh, these children living in two parent households have. Is it, 
That's a kind of an so awkward would, way of I saying would, it. But. I would say it this way, which is um, children who are born to college educated parents are much more likely, more than 20% of right. points more likely to be living with married parents. And so this reduction in marriage has happened primarily among adults without college degrees. Right. And the corresponding increase in the share of kids being raised in one parent home has been largely has largely happened outside of the set of kids born to parents with a college degree. This is actually sort of amazing if you think about this. From 1980 to now, the share of kids whose moms have a college four-year college degree who live in a married parent home has fallen from 90% to 84%. So that's only decreased six percentage points, even though so many more moms have a college degree now, and that's a much bigger, more heterogeneous, varied group of women. I think it's really quite noteworthy that the most highly educated women in our society, those who are most likely to have their own high levels of economic success, they are still the ones raising their kids in married parent homes at a very similar rate to the past. And so this too is an important sort of counterpoint to the idea that, well, feminism has really led to this liberation that's led to single motherhood. Single motherhood is not a feminist success story. Women who have most have, who have benefited the most from feminism to the extent that they have wonderful educational attainment and lots of economic opportunities, they're still the ones who have really the benefit of having another committed partner in the house, helping them raise kids, financially contributing. So I, I think that class divide by college degree is just really important. And it actually counters a lot of claims about what's going on here. Mm. Yes, th this was sort of a, a revelatory thing that I learned in your book that most of this can be divided among class lines, that the um, the the amount of people with college education who are getting married is roughly the same as the amount of people or per percentage wise as it was in 1980. But then we yeah. see for people who have uh, less than, than a college education that the marriage rates have gone way, way, way down. And then, of course, accordingly, the, the out of wedlock birth rates have gone way up and single motherhood has gone way up. So to transition to the $64 million question, why? Why? I, you know, my read of all of the data and all of the evidence and all of the studies is that it's both economics and social norm changes, right? So in let's just do a very broad sweep of what's happened in this country. So let's go back to the 60s and 70s for a minute. And that's where we hit the social revolution, the cultural revolution, changing expectations about gender norms. And during those decades, we saw a decrease in marriage that was roughly proportional across the educational distribution. So everyone, after the cultural social changes of the 60s and 70s, got married a little bit less, okay? Mm -hmm. But then the decline in marriage stalled out among college-educated adults. And this is what you were just saying. College-educated adults have continued to get married, raise their kids in two-parent homes at roughly the same rate. But there was a divergence, and marriage continued to decline, and rates of single motherhood continued to rise, among adults with a high school degree and less than a high school degree. What happened in the 80s and 90s that might have caused this divergence? So we've got this new social structure where single motherhood, non-marriage is all more socially acceptable, but we add on to that economic changes, that really global economic changes, globalization, technological developments, automation, a whole bunch of things that we know from vast amounts of studies in economics really benefited college educated adults and not everyone else as much. And so over this time period, the 80s, 90s, and the early 2000s, non-college educated men saw their economic positions erode, both in an absolute sense and relative to women. What do I mean by that? Employment rates fell, full-time employment rates fell among men without college degrees. Their earnings relative to what women who they were partnering with, non-college educated women were making, they fell. And so in very crude terms, the economic desirability of non-college educated men as marriage partners was diminished to some extent. We also know that you know, economic malaise leads to social malaise. You're more likely to have substance abuse, other problems that might decrease 
the marriage ability or marriage, you know, the attractiveness of, of certain men as marriage partners. And among those groups who were affected by these economic trends, those are the groups for whom we've seen a decrease in marriage and an increase in the share of kids living in single mother homes. Everything I'm describing, the way I've described it, is like a correspondence of trends over time across places. We also have really compelling studies in economics that do all the fancy things to try and get at causal relationships. And those studies do show a causal link between economic changes that diminished both the, again, the absolute and relative economic position of non-college educated men and a reduction in marriage and an increase in single parent homes in those groups, in those places where these things happened, where these shocks happened. Um, you know, so that's like an economic story. The economics changed in a new social regime and you get this increase in kids being born outside of marital unions, being raised, more likely to be raised in single parent homes. And I do, again, my read of the evidence is that there's a, an amplifying effect here that once higher rates of single motherhood, you know, higher separation rates of marriage and having kids are established in a community, those are places where then even when we see improved economic positions for men, so for example, I have a study of what happens in towns outside of North Dakota, but like in Texas, Oklahoma, all these other places where there were fracking towns, a lot of jobs came in, more money came in. In this new paradigm, in this new social world, we see an increase in earnings for non-college educated men. We see more people having kids because they can afford it, but we don't see an increase in marriage and we don't see a reduction in the share of kids born outside marriage. And so, you know, the way I read this is that these social norms and economic shocks have interacted and now we're in a bad, in a bad paradigm in a lot of places. And when I say bad, I realize it's a loaded term. There's a judgment here. I mean bad from the perspective of kids. This is not a good thing for kids. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So j just quickly, I want to make sure I, I heard you correctly and perhaps I didn't. So, so you're saying that non-college educated men and women, but, but mostly men may have more capital than, than they had 40 years ago. Uh, I, I feel like you just maybe no, I, that, that didn't seem right. I, th I thought that you had just said that, but, but it doesn't seem to make sense that, because I remember in your book that the chart was s sort of state, yeah. like the earnings have been stagnant, uh, but the marriage rates have gone down. Okay. Exactly. So, so basically it's just over the past 40 years, it's been just a lot harder across the board to interact in, in, in the economy when you don't have a college degree, your earnings have sort of been stagnant yeah and and then by the way like then this makes it worse right right so this, it, this erodes economic security even were in even more than just the labor market trends because now households headed by a high school graduate they're 23 percentage points more likely to just have one hmm. adult in the house as opposed to two and so just less overall earnings potential and so actually household income for people outside the college educated class has gone up by even less than it would have just from meager earnings changes. Um, and, and so, and household inequality has widened by even more than it would have just from labor market changes because you add on top of the labor market changes, these changes in marriage rates. Right. So it seems obviously, as you're saying, that there's been this economic malaise, which has, as you write and as you say, you know, contributed to to social problems, despair. You talk about um, dependence on on alcohol and drugs in, in some of these communities. You know, economic malaise leads to social malaise. And then also, as you acknowledge, there's been this supplemental kind of cultural revolution of, you know, you don't need marriage. Marriage is kind of this antiquated old institution. It's the new modern world. And then to make the story more complicated, you throw in, I, I think the I think birth control has in part contributed to this where I think b before uh, n when was birth control created? 1960s, right? There, there, are, there are actually studies showing that in the 60s and 70s, when you know birth control became more readily available, abortion became legalized. There's a very famous paper on economics that basically shows that these, the, you can imagine the way economic, uh, economists write about this, like it's a technological shock, mm -hmm. but basically that led to the erosion of the shotgun marriage because it changed the whole bargaining game between men and right. women when there's planned pregnancy. 
Yes, because that was part of like what happened in the 60s and 70s that created new social norms and structures. Right. Because you, before the pill, you know, you 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 as a woman had more of an in, incentive to get married because, you know, you wanted to really make sure that that if you were going to bear a child, it would be within the the institution of, of marriage, which is really protecting for for women. But then now with the pill, you can kind of take your time more, maybe kick the marriage can down the road. If you do happen to get pregnant, you don't need to get married. As you say, the shotgun marriages have decreased. So it seems like there's this big like cauldron of of uh, different ingredients thrown in there that has contributed to to this uh two parent or lack of two parent household where again it's been economic it's been cultural and um well, we're here now yeah, and, it's bad and i want to be clear like there are, are social benefits to all this right so so things like the pill allowed women to invest in their education more to delay childbearing and has contributed to women's economic success and things too like changes that made um you know that moved to unilateral or no fault divorce made it easier for women to escape abusive relationships right and so that's not to say that all of these social changes didn't have benefits in particular for women the question is just whether in some sense the pendulum has swung sufficiently far that now the social norms connecting marriage and two parent homes to the act of having and raising kids have been so divorced <laughs> for you know an, an unfortunate choice of words but so divorced again primarily outside the college educated class which is noteworthy um that that now kids are suffering as a result and and so maybe the pendulum needs to swing back a little bit farther and and we need to think more carefully about what's the best way to set up kids, a home for kids to really thrive. Um, but I also don't want to lose sight of the fact that this new social norm and, and the prevalence of one parent households isn't just tough on kids, it's really tough on the moms primarily who are doing this by themselves. And, you know, this is where too, I think people who are really concerned about, about equity should, should be bothered by the fact that again, the most privileged advantaged adults in society are the ones who have the benefit of a partner to raise their kids, which is a, you know, a really time consuming hard thing. And we need to ask a difficult question of why are so many of these parents finding themselves unable to achieve healthy, stable two parent relationships? You cited the fragile family survey, which, you know, we hear from those couples themselves that at the time of their child's birth, many of them want to be together. They plan to stay together and then, and then they don't. And I think when you read the ethnographic accounts and the surveys of these adults, you realize that the, the choices that it looks like they're making are very, very constrained choices. There are real barriers. There's, there's limited employment stability. There's a lot of challenges. Many of them didn't grow up in stable two parent households. And so again, from like an empathetic point of view, it's, um, you know, what, what one sociologist um, Sarah Helper Meekin refers to as social poverty. Like these parents, these, many of these couples say they want to be together. They want someone to do this with too. And so I think, you know, asking why having a stable marriage in a two parent home seems to have become a luxury good that's something only the most advantaged groups in society seem able to achieve in large numbers is something that, from an empathetic point of view, um, from an equity point of view, everyone should be deeply concerned about. Absolutely. It's absurd to me whenever we have conversations like this that, and I, I said it in the introduction, that people say, oh, well, talking about the the two-parent, the lack of two-parent household problem is offensive to single mothers. No, precisely to your point, you're acknowledging how extraordinarily difficult it is to be a single mother. And, you know, I, I said the P word at the beginning of this episode was privilege that we hear a lot. We also hear the word patriarchal and patriarchy right. thrown around a lot. And it's amazing to me that how much our society obsesses about patriarchy and misogyny, they ignore the fact that the that the that the burden of raising children in a single parent household falls almost always on the mother, not on the father. So my question for you is and you you pose this in your book and obviously analyzed it at length is why is it that so many of the single parents are mothers and not fathers? 
Yeah, I mean, this is where, you know, why we need to reframe this away from a conversation that sounds like we're blaming the single mothers because they're the ones who are, you know, in 80% of single parent homes, they're the ones doing this by themselves. So we might ask them, where are the dads? Mm -hmm. And I am very careful in the book. I'm deliberate in not referring to deadbeat dads. Remember, 40% of kids are born outside of married parent homes. 30% of kids are being raised outside of two parent homes. So there are a lot of different circumstances. There's no one caricature that we could draw that describes what these families look like. And so there are certainly some situations where the dad, and in some cases the mom, just disappeared and left the other parent with basically no choice but to doing this by themselves. And we have to do much more to help those families. But on the other extreme, I think, you know, again, just because there's such large numbers now, there are also cases where you get the sense that there's just an ambivalence. We'll give this a shot. We're not ready to commit to marriage, you know, where maybe it wouldn't take that much for those parents to, to give it a shot, to live together, to commit to being together, you know, that both basically to pool their resources and raise their kids and, and take care of a household together. So there's a big variety of, you know, situations. Um, I think we should be doing more as a society across the board to help families where they are. For some of them, that means giving them the resources they need to get over the barriers to achieve the marriage and the healthy two-parent family that they themselves express wanting. And then in cases where the second parent is really just you know, not able or not willing to commit in helping that single parent family and their kids. So they're not, you know, just really being hindered by a lack of resources, which is the case tragically for many of these families. Mm-hmm. Mm. Before we continue with Professor Carney and see, I got it, Carney. <laughs> I want to quickly tell you about my pillow. I use many MyPillow products. I walk into work every day wearing the slippers, the, the MyPillow slippers, because they're so comfortable. I sleep on a MyPillow and I use my towels. And you can get many of these products at a discount if you use the promo code Hartman, which is my last name spelled H-A-R-T-M-A-N. For a limited time, you'll get 60% off of the Giza Dream Sheets that comes with a 60-day money-back guarantee and a 10-year warranty. You'll get a set for as low as $39.99 with the promo code Hartman. Just go to MyPillow.com and click on the radio listener square and use the promo code Hartman or call 1-800-566-6745 and you guessed it, use the promo code Hartman to get deep discounts on many MyPillow products, including the MyPillow mattress topper, the aforementioned MyPillow towel sets, and much more. You know, the great thing about your book, Professor Carney, is that there are so many more things I could ask you about. And I'm trying right now just to pick the most important thing. But but again, it's just all the more reason why everyone should should get this book, really, because you explore so many facets of this problem. You know, I, I want to address some counter arguments here. And we've done that a little bit in this discussion. Uh, Primarily, you know, we've been talking about this this difference in in class um, among class lines and in, in marriage and in out of wedlock births, and we've talked about some some cultural issues or cultural factors that may have contributed to this. You know, something that I hear a lot in these discussions is that people will say that single uh, single mother households have proliferated because of the um, amount of teen pregnancy and the fact that teens don't have access to birth control or they don't have access to abortion, that one always puzzled me because up until recently, Ro, you know, Roe v. Wade made abortion legal in all 50 states. But, but putting that aside, that is something we hear a lot, the teen pregnancy argument. And if we just stop teen pregnancy, then this out of wedlock birth rate, the single motherhood problem would be eliminated. What is your response to that? Teen pregnancy is actually down by over 70% from the mid-90s. So this has been a, a really remarkable trend. Teen births are way down. If you told me back in the mid-90s that teen birth rates were going to fall as much as they did, I would have predicted that we'd see a decrease in single-parent homes. But what's happened is that the prevalence of single-parent homes has really moved up the age distribution, up the education distribution. In fact, among women of all 
you know, five year age groups, race and ethnic groups, major race and ethnic groups, education groups, the share of births that are un to unmarried mothers has gone up. And so it's really, despite the dramatic decrease in teen childbearing and more generally the decrease in births to all women under the age of 30, um, despite that, we've had this increase in single motherhood. And so that is, I mean, that is a misconception, um, but also I think it's underappreciated how widespread now single parent homes are among the high school educated class. And so the, the divide now isn't really among the most disadvantaged single mothers, women without a high school degree and everybody else. It's the college educated moms and adults that are really setting themselves apart by continuing to get married and have their children inside a marital union in really, you know, the same sort of shares as in the past. This is sort of hearkening back to something that you said earlier, but about feminism that, you know, a lot of college educated women who may identify as as feminists or champion, you know, feminism, they are they are the ones, as you say, getting married and having kids and, and being kind of traditional. And, and how ironic is that? Right. Exactly. And so that's why when, you know, I've been getting a lot of pushback since the book came out. In I September, bet. Remember I bet. The lines is like, well, marriage is fundamentally incompatible with feminism. And, and I'm like, but, but the women who, again, are really thriving economically are the ones who still have kids inside marital unions and are still raising their kids in married parent homes. And so are, you know, women who write about this, why? Because, you know, they, these are the college educated women who are super successful and they're out there writing about this and talking about this. They, everybody, we all know a friend who's like 40 and she's very successful and she didn't find the love of her life and she did this on her own. That is not the typical single mother in this country. The typical yes. single mother in this country is not a very highly educated woman making six figures. And I think the focus on that image of a single mother really skews our perception and makes people less willing to admit that for most single mothers, they are doing the heroic work of raising kids and holding a household together on um on more limited resources and and so it's not this feminist utopia that i think some people would like to think uh think it is absolutely and i remember being in college having a conversation with someone about the the decline of the the nuclear family the war on the nuclear family and this individual was coming back at me saying, you know, oh, well, again, this is antiquated, these conceptions of the nuclear family. And I said to her, did you not grow up in a two-parent household? Are you not the beneficiary, and she did, are you not the beneficiary of, of these structures that you are supposedly decrying? And it's so, it's just, it's so irresponsible. And really, I, I think it's a, a level of fraudulence that a lot of the the people who are spreading these kinds of, you know, lies about, oh, well, you know, marriage doesn't matter and having kids inside of wedlock doesn't matter. They, they are the ones who are A, practicing it, and B, are the beneficiaries. So to end on a question that maybe we should have started with, but I think it really segues nicely from, from this, this discussion. Why does marriage matter? So marriage is the institution that really does deliver a stable two-parent home to kids. Right. And so it doesn't have to be that way. It could have been that we had such a strong social norm that even among couples who aren't married, they stayed together and raised their kids together throughout the child's lifetime. You're more likely to find that kind of structure in Europe where there's strong cohabitation prevalence. In the U.S., marriage is the institution that delivers the stable two parent household. And so then what are the benefits of that? You have two people combining their income. Income is very protective. It, it allows families to you know, buy houses in better neighborhoods with better schools, um, have better health outcomes. And so income is a big part of the story, but it's not all of it. We also know that kids who are growing up in married parent homes get more parental time, both because each parent, like when you just look at married moms or married dads separately, they each wind up spending more time with their kids than their unmarried counterparts. Why? Because there's another person in the house who could take care of some stuff while you can sit down and help the kid with the homework or drive them to soccer practice or read to them or talk to them, etc. 
And then, of course, the children of married parents have two of them in the house, so they get more parental time. And another big bucket of resources that I talk about is what I refer to as emotional bandwidth. And so we know, again, from studies, from data, that single mother homes, they're more likely to have stress, toxic stress. The moms are more likely to engage in sort of less nurturing parenting. And I, and I reject the idea that it's because those mothers are just somehow innately less patient with their children. And I lean heavily into the idea of when there's another person that you can lean on for support or to take some of the burden away from you, you're less likely to be burdened with all the stresses that comes from being the only person responsible on a daily basis for paying the bills, for cleaning the house, for cooking, for taking care of the kids, all these things. So, you know, there's all these mechanisms that deliver an advantageous situation to families in a two-parent married parent home. There's more income, there's more time, there's more emotional bandwidth. And so what do we see from that? We have mounds of social science evidence that the kids who grow up in that beneficial, privileged household structure are less likely to get in trouble in school, less likely to have social emotional problems, more likely to graduate high school, ultimately more likely to graduate college, more likely to be married as adults and have higher levels of earnings and household income themselves as adults. So this too is why it's such an important issue for us to be honest about and address because it is a way of perpetuating advantage or disadvantage across the generations. Mm, yes, I mean, it seems so obvious, right? But apparently it's not, clearly it's not. And we have to, to tell people again why this matters so much. And so thank you I mean, so much. Yeah. Thank you. I mean, Julie, what I'm really trying to do with this book by making it so data driven and evidence based is take it out of the culture wars to just say to your point, yes. this is obvious. Can we just agree on the data and all agree from a, you know, a position of who doesn't want to see more kids thrive? Who doesn't want to see more mothers have help and a beneficial you know, situation to raise their kids in. Let's let's take this out of the culture wars and just be honest about the data and collectively try to make it the situation better for kids in this country. Yes, this is not left versus right. This is just this is just reality. This is just sanity. And I, as I said, I really love your objective, data driven, economist approach to this very important issue. There's so much else I wanted to bring up. I, I mean, how we compare to Western Europe. American children are much more likely, you write, to experience two or three parental partnerships by age 15 compared to children in other Western nations. We didn't discuss the uh, the impact that it has on girls versus boys, that boys that grow up in single parent households are more likely to commit crime than than boys who don't and girls are more likely to become single mothers themselves i just want to give a synopsis to again encourage people to get your book throwing out some of the the topics that we didn't discuss but hey i guess i'll just have to have you on again soon <laughs> professor carney to to discuss what we left out thank you for your time i know how busy you are with three kids of your own and teaching so i very much appreciate your being here thank you so much it was a pleasure and thanks so much to all of you for being here with me. As a reminder to hit the subscribe button down below so that you can stay notified every time I post a new video. That would be so great if you could do that. And of course, you can email me at julie at julie-hartman.com anytime. I look forward to seeing you soon. Take care. <laughs>